In just 150 years, more than 90% of Europe's large mammals have disappeared from the natural landscape, submerging ecosystems into gradual collapse, compacted soils, biodiversity breakdown, and ecological cycles that had operated for thousands of years falling apart. In response, Europe tried everything, yet the ambition to restore forests never became reality. Because what disappeared was not in the canopy, but in the ecological links that once kept the entire landscape functioning. And to save an ecosystem, sometimes trees are not enough. Paradoxically, the solution came from a species that had been declared extinct in the wild more than a century ago. So why can bringing back a vanished species restart an entire system in decline? That is what we will explore in this episode. In 1919, the last wild European bison was killed. No ceremony. No one realized that this was the moment when the largest land animal in Europe vanished from nature. This is even harder to believe, considering that just a few centuries earlier, bison once roamed across Europe's plains, from the Iberian Peninsula to Scandinavia, from the Atlantic coast to the Caspian Sea. Their historical population is estimated to have reached hundreds of thousands, even millions of individuals. The decline did not begin with war. Bison had been hunted for food since the hunter-gatherer era. But the real turning point came when humans expanded agriculture. Overhunting, combined with large-scale deforestation, gradually collapsed the bison's habitat over centuries. Bison were not wiped out in a single moment, they were slowly suffocated by the expansion of civilization. By the early 20th century, conservationists believed the outcome was sealed. A species that had survived the Ice Age and thousands of years of climatic upheaval could not survive a single century of modern humanity. At that time, more than 50 European bison remained, all in captivity. Then World War I erupted like a final knife strike against a population already on the edge of extinction. Bison were hunted for meat, hides, and horns amid chaos and occupation. After the war, only two small herds remained. Nine individuals in the Białowieża forest in eastern Poland were hunted down until the last wild bison was killed in 1921. The other herd hid in the remote mountains of the Western Caucasus, but six years later, poachers found and shot the final individual. The European bison was officially extinct in the wild. Before their disappearance, European bison were creatures of extraordinary size, taller than humans and weighing nearly as much as a car. Yet they could move three times faster than an adult human and leap over obstacles that seemed impossible for such a massive body. At first glance, that power can be intimidating. But in reality, bison are calm, fully herbivorous animals that avoid conflict. In most situations, they choose retreat over confrontation. This unusual combination of immense size and gentle temperament made bison one of the least dangerous large mammals in natural ecosystems. Unlike their close relatives, the American bison, which favor vast open grasslands, European bison evolved in forests and mixed landscapes. They graze on grasses, browse shrubs and young branches, and move between dense forest and natural clearings. This feeding behavior is precisely what makes them so-called ecosystem engineers, because they actively rebuild ecosystems from the ground up. They do not merely live within ecosystems, they directly shape them, opening forests, creating clearings, and restarting biological cycles that had stalled. Where bison exist, many other species recover as well. Protecting bison, therefore, is not just about saving a single species, but about safeguarding the entire web of life that revolves around them. What is especially striking is how bison foraging creates a mosaic-like landscape where open patches, young shrubs, and mature vegetation interweave. 
This enables countless plant and animal species to rapidly flourish. For example, they create space for flowering shrubs within forests, attracting insects, which in turn draw birds and small mammals, spreading outward in cascading effects. An ecological paradox emerges. The largest animals create the conditions that allow the smallest organisms to survive. Biodiversity is not a collection of isolated species. It is a tightly interconnected system. Notably, the point where the two bison species intersect is not in form or habitat, but in the similar fate they once faced. When space disappears, even the largest species are erased from history. However, when bison vanished from the wild, only a little more than 50 individuals survived, carrying an invisible burden, a genetic crisis. With an extremely limited gene pool, inbreeding was no longer a risk, but an inevitability. Many scientists believe that even if bison did not go extinct immediately, they would gradually weaken, lose reproductive capacity, and disappear in silence. A small group of conservationists refused to accept that outcome, led by Polish zoologist Jan Stoltzman, who called for urgent action. Alongside him were Heinz Heck, director of the Munich Zoo, and his brother Lutz Heck, director of the Berlin Zoo. Together, they coordinated efforts to gather the remaining bison from zoos and private reserves. They founded the International Society for the Protection of the European Bison and presented a plan at the International Nature Conservation Conference in Paris in 1923. In 1932, the European Bison Pedigree Book was established, meticulously recording every individual and controlling every breeding decision to prevent genetic collapse. The question was not only whether the species would survive, but what it would survive as, a wild animal or a permanently managed population. By 1929, the first European bison were finally released back into the wild. The release site was not a symbolic coincidence. Białowieża Forest, the very place where the last wild bison had been killed. From there, the population grew slowly but steadily. Over decades, they gradually expanded into other major forests of Poland. As bison numbers rose into the hundreds, an unavoidable question emerged. Could they truly return to the wild? Many scientists objected. Could a species that had lived for generations behind fences still remember how to survive? The answer lay in Romania, in the Tarku Mountains, one of Europe's last remaining wild landscapes. If bison could not survive here, they would not survive anywhere. In 2012, Rewilding Europe and WWF Romania launched a project in the Tsarku Mountains. This is a vast region of old-growth forests, river valleys, and alpine grasslands. On May 17, 2014, European bison returned to the Romanian Carpathians for the first time in more than 200 years. A 15-hectare acclimatization enclosure was built to protect the first herd of 17 bison. This allowed researchers to monitor health, behavior, and prevent poaching. The early years after reintroduction did not resemble a success story. Many calves were killed by predators. Some weaker individuals did not survive the harsh winters. Within the herd, hierarchical relationships constantly shifted, creating conflict and stress. But then, something science cannot program began to emerge learned behavior. Calves born in the wild carried no memory of captivity. They learned how to read the landscape, avoid danger, and move in rhythm with the forest. After two years, the first herd was fully released. Subsequent reintroductions took place in 2018. Not every release was completely successful, but each one added more data, more experience, and more confidence that bison could stand on their own. By 2021, more than 100 European bison were living freely in the Tsarku Mountains, 
not hundreds, not thousands, but enough to prove something more important than numbers. This was a self-sustaining population. These individuals ranged across more than 200 kilometers kilometers, far beyond the original release area. They were not confined. They determined their own territory, a crucial sign that the species had truly returned to its original ecological role. The presence of bison quickly produced measurable changes. In areas where they lived, plant species richness increased by around 30%. Monotonous forests were gradually broken apart, replaced by mosaic landscapes, where grasses, shrubs, and young forests coexist. Bison dust bathing pits retained water, their dung enriched the soil. Their thick fur carried seeds across tens of kilometers. No orders were issued, no human hands coordinated the process. Bison did not restore nature. They triggered nature to do the rest on its own. But Sarku, a small corner of the Carpathians, was not an isolated case. Ten years after the first reintroductions, consolidated data from the European Bison Pedigree Book and the IUCN showed that European bison had returned at a continental scale. Poland and Belarus are now home to the largest European bison populations in the world, with more than 2,000 individuals in each country. These are not merely historical remnants of the Białowieża forest, but source centers for most rewilding projects across Europe. Beyond these two hubs, bison have reappeared in many other countries. Germany, the Netherlands, France, Denmark, Spain, Romania, Ukraine, Slovakia, Russia, and the Balkan states. According to data updated in 2024, Poland alone is home to approximately 2,800 European bison, an achievement that would have been considered impossible in the early 20th century. These populations reveal an important truth. Bison are not only returning to Europe's wildest places, but are gradually reclaiming landscapes that Europe once believed were permanently closed to large animals. The return of bison did not happen in a social vacuum. Local communities worried about crop damage. Questions about safety emerged. Rewilding, after all, is never purely an ecological issue. It is a process of negotiation. Some time ago, a male bison traveled farther than any individual before him. He swam across the Oder River, crossed the Polish-German border, and became the first free-ranging bison to do so in more than a century. What could have become a symbol of Europe's returning wilderness instead ended in tragedy. Within hours, German local authorities, out of fear and uncertainty, shot the animal. That story exposed an uncomfortable truth. While poaching still exists, the greatest threat to bison today is no longer the hunter in the deep forest, but conflict between wildlife and the ways humans use land. This is why conservation cannot stop at releasing animals. Rewilding organizations are forced to establish compensation funds, train local guides, and open direct channels of dialogue with communities. In reality, recorded damage is low, but fear does not disappear through statistics alone. The sad truth is that we have forgotten how to share landscapes with large animals. Adaptation, therefore, must come from both sides. Humans need to overcome fear, understand the gentle nature of bison and the ecological services they provide. Bison must be supported in learning how to move safely through settlements and farmland in an increasingly fragmented continent. At the same time, a new form of value began to emerge. Bison-centered ecotourism now brings around 2 million euros per year to the region. Guest houses, restaurants, guiding services, and local crafts have gradually developed. Not everyone benefits equally, but for the first time in decades, Wild nature is no longer only an obstacle to development, it has become part of the local economy. 
From just over 50 surviving individuals, the European bison population today has reached around 9,000 across the continent. But this number raises a harder question than any previous achievement. How much space does Europe still have for large animals? Roads, agriculture, settlements, and even renewable energy all compete for the same territory. Rewilding is not about turning back time to a pristine wild Europe. It is a process of redistributing space. And no option comes without pain. Pulling a species back from the brink of extinction and returning it to the wild is an extraordinary achievement. The story of the European bison is not only a conservation victory, but also a blueprint for rewilding large species across the continent. But it also exposes a larger question, not only for Europe, but for the entire modern world. If nature truly returns, how far are humans willing to step back? The past 10 years have only been enough to begin asking that question seriously.